Good evening everyone and welcome to the Norwich Crime Writing Festival 2020. Norwich Crime Writing Festival is a partnership between National Centre for Writing and the University of East Anglia. A huge thank you to Arts Council England and to this year's festival supporters Dead Good Books and The Crime Vault for making this event possible. My name is Flo Reynolds and I'm Programme Officer at National Centre for Writing. I also want to thank you for joining us for this very special event in which we welcome Olivier Norek, author of The Lost and the Damned, and literary translator Nick Kayser, who has translated the novel from French into English. Olivia and Nick will be interviewed by Kate Griffin, Associate Programme Director at the National Centre for Writing, and together they'll discuss The Lost and the Damned, the process of being translated, and why France is producing some of the highest calibre crime writing in the world. I hope you enjoy the event, and without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Olivier, Nick and Kate. Thank you very much, Flo. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the session with the French novelist Olivier Norek and his translator into English, Nick Kester. Um, we'll be talking about Olivier's first novel in English translation, which will be published in November this year by Maclehoe's Press. The Lost and the Damned is a suspenseful police procedural which draws on the author's own experience as a police officer. Just a little bit of introduction. Uh, Olivier Norek was born in 1975 and he's written six crime novels. He's also a writer on the hit French television series, Spiral. Nick Kester is a journalist and an award-winning translator from French, Spanish and Portuguese, who has translated at last count more than 80 books, including many crime novels. I wanted to start um, this evening by asking you both um, where you're joining us from. I'm here in Norwich. Uh, for me, I'm currently uh, near Paris. Well, when I say near Paris, it's like 22 meters on my left, but it's not Paris. We call it the suburban area of Paris. We call that the department 93. In France, uh, we put uh, numbers on our regions, like Marseille is 13, Paris is 75, and my place is the number 93. And you will see that is a valuable information for the rest of this uh, interview. And I'm at, uh, in my library at home in Norwich, the dark heart of British crime fiction. <laughs> That's great. Um, Olivier, according to your bio, you're a lieutenant in the investigations department of the SDPJ 93, which is a Paris-based wing of the French police force. Could you tell us how long you've been working um, with the police and in what roles? Um, how many times I, I was a, a copper, as you said? Yeah, exactly, exactly. 18 years, 18 years uh, where here, where I live in the Department 93, it is the, the most criminal place in France. That was, I told you before, it was a valuable information. So the 93 <laughs> was the most criminal place in France. Um, doing what? Uh, I was an investigator. Uh, I, did, uh, I did homicides, uh, I did a bit of uh, drug enforcement, uh, I worked in a unit against rapes, and I did a few kidnappings with or without uh, ransoms. So a very interesting career with the police that you've put to good use in your writing, but I wanted to ask what was your motivation for turning to fiction? First of all, it was a, it was a, um, a novel contest that I won on the internet eight, eight years ago. Uh, then I met publishers, and when they learned that I was a cop, the uh, idea of a book written by someone from the inside sounded like a, a, a good thing. But my, my real motivation was to, uh, to debunk the old cliches. Usually a cop is tired with uh, alcohol issues, 
uh, divorced or at least uh, unhappily married, uh, a bit of cocaine from time to time, of course. And uh, if his girlfriend can be an ex-prostitute, then you've got the perfect cliché. But in uh, 2020, it was time, I think, to speak about uh, the real police. And you don't have to make uh, a made-up stories. As I said before, the Department 93 is the most criminal place in France, where I met uh, murderers, serial rapists, even a cannibal. So I don't feel the need to add a broken cop with a broken life and broken dreams. My books are already very dark, especially because all my stories are coming from true facts. Uh, and the very few rays of sunshine are coming from my cops. So because the human cruelty have no bounds, I don't need to add anything. Yeah, you say um, in the novel, you describe um, Saint-Saint-Denis, uh, Departement 93, as this part of the city no one was sure whether they loved or hated. And one of your characters um, says that 93 has always been a den of cutthroats. So why try to pretend it's a holiday village? My question was going to be whether it is as bad as it sounds, but from what you're saying. Well, according to the statistics, it is. Mm. You have to... You have to consider other things. You have to consider my point of view, and my point of view is uh, the one from a, from a cop. Mm. I know my cities by the name of their streets. I know my cities by the crimes that occurred in, in, in those streets. Um, from my experience, uh, this is the street where uh, a dog ate two babies. This is the street where, for the first time in my career, I announced the death of a child but I didn't know at this moment that I, that I announced that during the birthday of the, of the younger brother. Uh, this is the street where we found the, the, the corpse of, um, of a fellow police officer. So even if you give me heaven, I will see a bit of darkness. I can find gloom in Saint-Tropez, uh, like uh, Agatha Christie founded gloom in, uh, the, in the English bourgeoisie. Uh, this is just a point of view. So the Department 93 is a bit doomed, but not totally lost. Nick, have you been to um, Saint-Saint-Denis? Did you feel the need to visit the place as part of your research? No, I think that like uh, a lot of English people, I've seen Saint-Saint-Denis through the windows of the Eurostar as you speed through into the city of Paris. A lot of uh, Olivier's book and the other subsequent books are about these two Parises, the one on the outskirts, the Bonlieu, and then how different that is from our tourist image of Paris itself. Uh, and, and one of the pleasures, of course, of translating is that you follow the description that Olivia builds up of that place and you feel you come to know it and you find the English equivalent of it. So uh, I haven't actually been there, but I feel as if I have. This would be a good point to um, ask you both to read a little bit from the book. Um, I'm going to ask Nick to read first, because I believe you're reading from the beginning, from chapter one. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, well, in fact, there's a prologue before chapter one, but this, in this scene, the, the protagonist, Victor Coste, the, the captain in the police force, gets the call in the middle of the night and he has to go and investigate what he knows is, is, is something horrible, some sort of murder or whatever. And it, it, it's just him getting out of bed and going to visit that crime scene. But as he does, he passes through, as we, we've just been saying, these two different Parises to get to Departement 93. Grimacing, Victor swallowed a cup of bitter coffee, leaning against the fridge where a post-it reading, by sugar, was coming unstuck. From the silence of his kitchen, he peered out at the sleeping buildings. His was the only light on in the neighborhood. And the city's wake-up call this morning, he told himself. Checking the gun at his waist, he pulled on a sweater and a baggy black coat and pocketed his keys. The police, Peugeot 306, didn't like the cold and refused to start. At this early hour, Victor Coste and his vehicle were in the same mood. He waited a while, lit a cigarette, coughed, tried again. After a few hiccups, the engine came to life. The empty streets offered him an avenue of red traffic lights, which he drove through cautiously until he came out onto the Route Nationale. Four endless grey lanes of asphalt spearing into the heart of the Paris outskirts. As he drove, the houses turned into high-rise buildings and then tower blocks. He looked the other way as he passed the Roma camps, 
lines of caravans pressed up against each other next to the railway lines. Washing hung out to dry on the metal fences, cordoning off this part of the city no one was sure whether they loved or hated. He closed his car window as he passed through the stench of the municipal rubbish dump just a few yards from the first dwellings. This showed, he thought, how far Departement 93 and its inhabitants were respected, as far as sticking mountains of garbage under their noses. An idea that ought to be suggested to the people living in the city of Paris itself, just to see how they liked it. Unless, of course, the poor and immigrants had a less keenly developed sense of smell. Past row upon row of construction firms and a quick hello to the black economy workers waiting in a huddle for the gangmaster's van, trying to arrive at the crime scene without feeling too depressed as a new day dawned. Voila. It's lovely, thank you. Yes, that gives us a really good sense of, of the place. Um, a wonderful introduction. I'm now going to ask Olivier to read. Um, Olivier is going to read in French, but um, if you want to see the translation, please just turn on the captioning and um, the English translation will come up. Olivier. Well, first of all, this is the occasion to show you the, the book in French. So it's Code 93. You translate it in The Lost and the Damned, but this is the uh, original version in French. So um, as you heard, the Captain Cost uh, was called uh, on a crime and uh, they found uh, a body and now this is the time for the autopsy. La légiste fit rouler près d'elle la table des instruments et choisit un scalpel. Elle appuya sa main sur le mollet gauche du cadavre et entailla profondément la peau et la chair sur toute leur longueur. Le muscle s'ouvrit largement comme une fleur rouge. Dans l'indifférence générale, le cadavre du géant, le visage écrasé contre la table, ouvrit grand un œil. Je ne vois rien de particulier, pas de trace de coup. La légiste se pencha et attrapa fermement l'autre mollet pour l'inciser d'un même geste, rapide et précis. Dans une plainte aiguë et assourdissante, le mort se redressa sur ses coudes. Coste et la jeune femme se figèrent. Il tordit son cou vers l'arrière et regarda ses deux mollets ouverts avant de tourner la tête vers l'homme et la femme qui restaient sidérés devant lui. Il tenta de se lever et ne réussit qu'à s'effondrer en renversant les tables chargées d'instruments et de bocaux dans un fracas de métal et de verre brisé. Tombé lourdement au sol, il s'empara du premier scalpel à portée de main et le brandit devant lui. Coste sortit son arme, se plaça devant la légiste et le pointa juste au niveau de l'épaule. Incapable de se mettre debout, l'homme recula sur le carrelage blanc et sang en poussant péniblement sur ses mains jusqu'à s'encastrer dans un coin de la pièce, le scalpel toujours dressé. Il tremblait, le regard vide se posant au hasard. Coste se sentit ridicule de braquer un homme en état de choc et rengaina son arme. « Putain, il guérit vraiment vite, votre type, Coste. That's great. Is that um, episode based on something you experienced? You said that um, you've experienced all sorts of things in Departement 93. Yeah, um, in fact, about... About 95% of my books are, uh, are, are coming from true facts. It's a deal uh, between the reader and me. Um, what you're going to read is the truth. And if it's real, by a, a sort of mirror effect, the reader thinks that the characters are real too. So they feel like they are a part of the team. In fact, in my books, it's a team of four cops and you are the fifth. And all you're going to read happen to someone one day. My books are not just stories, they are real life. Mm. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you about your protagonist, Captain Victor Cost. Um, what for you are the most important aspects of his character and his backstory? And what is his approach to investigating? I, I don't know which is the, 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 the principal character, but when you create your first hero, uh, he's never very, very far off who you are. So I like to think that the Captain Cost is a bit like me. In his mind, there is the victim and nothing else but the victim. When you accept a case, uh, then you are responsible of the victim. Uh, you can see the world as a scale. And when somewhere a crime is committed, so the scale is imbalanced. So my cop, like every cop, is just someone who tries to get the balance right and, to, and, and do it again every day 
every week, every year. Uh, so COP is not a job, it's a, it's a vocation. And this is how it feels my, uh, my, my captain cost. How much of your writing is based on your own experience as a police officer? Victor Cost says that to roam the corridors of a police headquarters is to come face to face with all the worst aspects of mankind. Is that how you feel about working for the police? I like this sentence. In French, it's, it's shorter. Uh, mm -hmm. face à ce que l'humain recèle de pire en lui. Um, yes, I, feel, I, I do feel like that because when you're a cop, your world is darker because you only meet the other when he's falling, when he's hurt, when he lies or, or when he died. And at the end, the day-to-day -day life of a cop is the sorrow of people. It's a bit disturbing if you don't have the right shape for it, but it's manageable. Nick, in your translation, you include a number of footnotes and also a note on the French police forces at the end. Did you have to do a lot of research for the translation? Um. Well, the problem is always that, uh, as usual in Britain, we're, we're separated from the continent, so things are done differently here. And it, it is a bit of a labyrinth, the, the French police ranks, for example, I had to look them up and everything. It's the same with the legal process, which of course is completely different from ours. So you have to tread very carefully with that. But Olivier helped me with the, with the different, uh, different sorts of, of police in France. And, uh, he himself, even for French readers, he had to put quite a few footnotes because there's been a proliferation of, of special squads who, who are there, the riot police, the people who, who come in when, when there's disturbances in Departement 93. And so even for French people, things like Hyde, he has to explain. Uh, I hope that we do it succinctly enough that people don't get stuck on it. That, that's the main thing, to keep, keep the, the movement going, keep the pace going. Yeah, and you've kept the names in French of the police department. Yes, I, th I think that I think that that gives a, a sense that uh, when you're reading foreign crime novels, you're, you're traveling like oh, I was on the Eurostar. You, you're taking a journey, mm -hmm. and I think this helps convince people. Oh, yes, we're, we're in France. It reminds them every so often that that, that we're not we're not in 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 England. Olivier, um, you talk about the difficulties faced by the police and the brutal reality of their jobs. You also mention the statistics, 10,000 policemen wounded every year, an average of 10 or so killed, plus the suicides. One of Cost's colleagues, Lieutenant um, Aubin, is moving away from Paris for the sake of his family because of the toll of his job, long hours, depression, is this a widespread issue within the police force? Well, you, uh, you mentioned the word depression. A depression, a depression is, a good thing. Uh, is a good thing because your body and your mind give you a warning. You are not okay. The worst is when you don't see any more. Um, let's say uh, your first corpse leave a stain on you. Then your first victim of rape make a second stain, then a third, and then again. But you can see them, you remember them. But a few years later, your soul is covered by stains and you don't feel anymore. You can see no more that you are, in fact, slowly drowning. This is the risk, not feeling anything anymore. So you have to wake up before for your own sake. Thank you. Um, what about corruption within the force? One of your characters says that power is a source of temptation that is hard to resist. A police ID card and a firearm can give the impression of superiority in many ways, sometimes to the law itself. How do your colleagues react when you write about these issues? Oh, they know. <laughs> they know. Power is a poison. And uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, we are not citizens, we are super citizens, not because we are better, only because uh, we chose to represent the law. When a citizen commits an offense, he's punished. When a cop does, he must be punished twice, twice harder. Uh, the, power, um, the power we have is not a free pass. It's a power given by citizens. So this power is a responsibility. Uh, of course, there is, um, there is corruption, because we are not robots, so we are fallible. We are not different. We are just the perfect reflection of the society. So we need to be controlled and punished way more than the others. 
Nick, um, Olivier said that the, had pointed out that the title in French um, is Code 93, but in English it's The Lost and the Damned. Could you tell us how you came up with this title for the English translation and why it's different to the French? I was also wondering how it affected the cover design because the image for the English edition is quite different to the French cover. Yes, well, I think obviously quite often, in fact, the titles of, of works are, are a problem to, to translate into English because, because in the original language, people immediately recognize what it's about. But for example, code 93 in English doesn't mean anything. We, whereas in France, you know, 93 is that département just outside Paris where they have all the problems and they have the, the riots and the cars burning and all, all the, the things that uh, Olivier describes in his book. But that doesn't work in English. So you have to find something that will, will attract people, will draw people in. Uh, and... Uh, Often, in fact, it isn't the translator who decides that, it's the publisher, and that was the case here. One of the editors who was, who was copy editing the translation was the one who decided that to make it quite dramatic, the lost and the damned, it sounds a bit Scott Fitzgerald to me, but that's what he thought. And so we all went with that title because it means a lot more than, than the original French. And the same, I think, is true of the cover the translator doesn't really get involved in, in the design of the book, mm. but I think I really like it. It's got this kind of pulp fiction feeling to it that makes it, I think, accessible. Again, that's the main thing that you're after, to try and attract the reader, to, to get them to, to identify with it and want to know more. So that, that, that's what happened in this case. Olivier, The Lost and the Damned includes some really quite dramatic deaths playing with contemporary references such as vampires and zombies. But the plot somehow reminded me more of classical revenge tragedies. Are you inspired by theatre and the classics? Well, of course I am. Every, every writer is, because theatre and classics invented everything. I'm just trying to, um, to put a bit of modernity. Um, you saw the, the, the work of Kenneth Branagh with Shakespeare. Uh, I try to do it with criminal novels, faster, harder, stronger, with powerful and empathic characters. So, um, so yes, I, I, I'm just fond of the work of Kenneth Branagh and I just tried to, uh, to do the same thing with crime novels. Great, thank you. Um, Nick, another question for you. Um, how would you describe Olivier's prose style? Um, what were the challenges in translating the novel from that perspective? And I was wondering particularly how you dealt with his humour, which comes across very strongly. Yes, well, he's, he's just answered you about his style. In fact, it's fast and hard and very pacey. And that's mm. what you've got to get over in the English. You don't want to be that famous word clunky. You don't want it to, people to stumble in the English. You've got to get the rapidity of, of the original. And also, Olivier is very good at uh, piling on the suspense. The, the book's in, in more than 30 short chapters, and each chapter adds an ingredient to the, to the tension, to the suspense, to what's going on. It's not like uh, Agatha Christie, where you've got six people in a room and you, have the, you go through the different motives they may, might have, but there are clues and they do build up as to who, who the murderer is or what's going on. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. So you have to try and keep that in mind as, as well that you're, you're, you're helping the, the reader build up this, this jigsaw puzzle and, and adding a bit each time. The other main points, I think, are the dialogue. He's, he's, Olivier is very good at dialogue, particularly the banter, the repartee within the police force, each, to, each mm -hmm. to one another. And again, in English, you have to try and make that sound convincing. You don't want people to be sort of making long-winded jokes that, that people nobody, nobody can get in English. And, and that's, that's, as you say, his humour, there's, there's the one level, which is that between the different people in the police force or some descriptions like that. But there's a far darker humour, as we, we've heard in, his, um, in the extract that Olivier read, which is, uh, which is in fact where a dead body comes to life on the autopsy slab. And he, there's a, there's a touch of very, very dark humour in that. And in English, you have to try and keep it humorous and shock people, but not, 
make them want to throw the book away because they're so repelled by it. So that, that's, that's one of the difficulties of translating his humour. But that's also one of the, the pleasures of it, finding equivalence in English and finding a way of, of, of keeping the reader turning the page. Yeah, and I think your tr translation does capture that strong sense of camaraderie um, within the police force that Olivier was talking about. Olivier, one example of Cost's humour is when he comments, what with this work at weekends and the nights spent at headquarters, he was beginning to feel like a caricature of a TV officer. He knew that this was not a good thing. That leads me on to my next question. As well as writing novels, you also write for the television series, Spiral. Could you tell us about the series? Yeah, um, first of all, I was born with this television show. Well, police speaking, police speaking, I was born with this television show. I was a young cop when the season one occurs, then I grew up with the Spiral team. And one day I wrote this book, The Lost and the Damned, and the showrunner called me uh, at my home and told me, do you want to play with us? Uh, it was a season six, and I say yes, of course, and the circle was complete. Um, I had the feeling to walk into my dreams. It was a bit weird, like if um, one morning I was able to pass through my screen and talk with my heroes. That was um, a fantastic and a marvelous experience. What is the process of writing, and how do you work with your co-writers? Um, how does it differ from writing novels, and which do you prefer? Well, there is two questions. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's very disturbing because I'm a writer, so I used to work alone. Working as a team, when you are creating, it's like if you, if you need to uh, perpetually to ask the permission, may I, may I write that, may I say that, uh, may I do that? Um, you know, there is, a, there is a phrase in French, it's uh, être, un, être un ours, to be a bear. So I may seem, I may seem fluffy, but I'm very solitary. And when I create stories, I like to be my own captain. Teamwork as a cop, I say yes. As a writer, I'm less convinced. And um, you ask about uh, the difference between writing novels and, um, and scripts. This is, this is very not the same thing. When you write a book, you choose the characters, the colors, the places, even the decoration of their, of their homes. But when you write a script for TV or movie theater, it's only dialogues and actions. Anything that is visual, is no more your job. This is the director's job. Um, who is going to play the hero or the bad guy? It's the director's job. Where are we going to shoot the movie? It's the director's job. Even your story uh, can be changed by the director. So it's a, it's a teamwork, but sometimes you don't even belong to the team. Did I sound a bit bitter? <laughs> not at all, not at all. Oh. <laughs> I know you, Nick. Uh -huh. um, Nick, could you tell us a little bit about the novel's route into English? Um, I was wondering how did McLehose Press find the novel um, and how you came to translate it? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about whether you worked with Olivier on the translation. Well, how it, how it came into English, I, I work quite often with Maclehos Press, who are specifically a, a publishing house that does translations. And they were responsible really for launching Scandi Noir, for example, some years ago. And they, they have very good connections with the French publishing industry. And as you say, they recognize the quality of the, of the French crime fiction that's being produced now. So they, they were hoping always to, to follow on from Scandi Noir to... French noir, uh, and I was translating another good contemporary author for them called Dominique Sylvain, who had a rather eccentric pair of, of female detectives, Lola and Ingrid Diesel, and I translated two or three of those books for them, but it didn't, they didn't really catch on, so it wasn't the kind of the, the big boom in, in French noir that they were hoping for, but it was at that time that I read uh, Code 93, The Lost and the Damned, and I loved it. So I suggested it to, to Maclehos, and they were keen to, to carry on exploring the, the world of French crime fiction through Olivier's work. So I've done two now and I'm hoping to do the third uh, this autumn. I often prefer to, to, a bit like Olivier, I think a translator works on his or her own 
trying to find the solutions to the problems or the, the challenges set by the original. And I also feel that, well, by now, by the time that I'm translating, Olivier is already on his sixth or seventh or eighth novel anyway and, and probably wants to forget the very first one he did. So I, I, I try not to bother him. But we did, we did uh, exchange, on again, on, on police ranks and on street slang, which I'm not particularly up with in... in in, uh, in Paris suburbs, uh, and I think we got on very well. We met and he gave us a very nice meal, um, yeah. and I hope we can continue without, uh, without being bitter about it. So Olivier, could you tell us more about The Lost and the Damned? Yes, I can. Uh, it's a bit complicated, so I'm going to simplify, and I made uh, a few rehearsals. Uh, in fact, I, I think that I made too much rehearsals, so maybe it won't feel something like natural, uh, so uh, my excuse by advance. Um, the Lost and the Damned. Uh, maybe you don't know, but Paris is going to suffocate. There are no places to park, uh, no apartments to rent, uh, and unbearable traffic jams. So uh, the French government came up with uh, this idea. Let's make a bigger Paris, and let's call it the Greater Paris. So to do that, to enlarge the area, let's add the, the neighboring boroughs. So to be a part of the Greater Paris project, all the boroughs must meet this one specific criteria. The crime rate must be equivalent to the crime rate of Paris. Some of the boroughs have the same crime rate, so there is no problem. Some of them, some of them have lower crime rate, so that's even better. But one of them, just one, the Department 93 mine, blew the score out of the water with a 30% higher crime rate. So logically, if the Department 93 wants to take the opportunity of being a part of this project, it has to lower its, its rate crime of 30%. And here is the, the, the despicable part of the true story. Instead of working more, instead of giving the means to our policemen uh, to get the job done, our commandment decided to hide 30% of the crimes by destroying the files. As simple as that. They decided to hide murders. So the lost and the damned are those people murdered and forgot just for statistics. Um, then for my part, it was uh, simple. I just had to invent a murderer who was very proud of his crimes and furious to see that uh, they are hidden and who decides to be, as an answer, as visible as possible and as creative as possible in the presentation of his future murders, so no one can hide them. So, for Redoumé, uh, this is a story of a criminal who wants to be seen, facing cops who wants to bury his work, and in the middle, in the eye of the storm, there is, on one side, my hero, the Captain Cost, hunting for this criminal, and on the other side, dirty cops, who wants to stop my captain by any means. This is the plot of uh, The Lost and the Damned. That's a wonderful summary. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> the Lost and the Damned is the first in a trilogy, um, the Bonnier trilogy. Could you tell us more about the rest of the trilogy and what you're hoping to achieve with the whole series? Yeah. <clears throat> I used to say that uh, in the first episode, you meet the team. In the second, you love the team. And at the third, one of them is going to die, of course. So we just spoke about uh, The Lost and the Damned. The second episode is called Territoire. Uh, I can translate it by This is this book. Um, and the plot is, um, after the murder uh, of a kid by cops, there are riots in the wall city. The city is on fire, I mean really on fire, and uh, in the eye of the storm, once again, uh, the Captain Cost uh, and his team are going to investigate on another crime, not related with the kid's death, but in the same city. And when you are investigating, surrounded by a thousand of people seeking to kill a cop by revenge, it's obviously not so easy. So the second episode is a day in hell for the Captain Cost. And uh, for the third, it's, well, it's called Sertation, I write it, I wrote it. This is the book. Surtention. I don't know the, the translation for uh, Surtention, Nick. I, I don't think it's been decided yet. Okay. So, Surtention, 
uh, this is the story of the greatest prison escape, but with no violence. Well, at least at the beginning, no violence, because uh, during this escape, four of the most wanted criminals uh, vanished, and the captain cost has a few days to bring them all back in prison. Uh, but this book, Sur Tension, is much more than that. It's a, it's a puzzle of five different stories, but with one great and dramatic ending, like, a, like an explosion at the end. Uh, Nick, will we be able to read um, the rest of the trilogy in English anytime soon? Uh, I certainly hope so. That This first one is coming out, as you said, in November this year. Uh, the second one, which in French is Territoire, and in English we've called it Turf Wars, should come out next year. And then I'm hoping to start on, on the third and final one, which, as uh, Olivier says, brings everything to a very dramatic conclusion and, and has to be read with the other two. I'm hoping to, to be able to start that next year. Uh, so, yeah, I hope we can follow all three. He, he, um, Olivier uh, is super productive. He also has produced three non-post <coughs> novels, which are very interesting. One about the the migrants who want to go from Calais across to, to the United Kingdom. And another one, which is called, described as an eco-thriller. So maybe as well as the trilogy, we can somehow fit those in as well, but we, we'll have to see. You've translated quite a lot of crime over the years. What, I mean, what for you are the challenges of translating this particular genre? Well, I think as we said, it's, uh, if it's, if it's a good thriller in French or in Spanish or whatever, it's got to be very pacey. It's got to move you on the whole time. It's got to make you want to discover what, about the crime and what's happened and who the, the heroes are and how they're going to confront the situation. So the challenge is, is to, make it, to, to make it speed along in English as well and to, to make sure that you're creating the suspense as, as with Olivier, drop by drop, bit by bit, to make sure that... The, the English reader gets that. And, and, and at a certain point, I think it's important as well for them to, to feel, to forget that they're in France or wherever, that they feel that they're, they're directly involved in it and it could be happening to the police force down the road from them, mm -hmm. that it feels that, that they're that engaged, you know, that, that, that you've got to try and do that. Uh, and I think those are the main things. And it's also... With Olivier, the use of language is very lively. It's, it's contemporary language. It's language of the street. It's language of, of the police force. It's language of camaraderie, as you said. And it's important and, and sometimes quite difficult to, to capture that in English. Um, you, have to, you have to rethink it. You have to think of the pictures. It's a bit like watching it on television and thinking what you can see. You have to put, put that back into, into, into your English, if you can. Olivier, um, could you tell us a little more about your inspirations, um, television, cinema, books? Oui, j'ai fait ma petite sélection. Yes, I made, uh, I made my little selection. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's begin by television. Um, first of all, The Wire. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, Luther with Idris Elba. Uh, the Killing, that's, that's wonderful. And maybe the, the best show ever, The Office but not your office, the American office, not with uh, Ricky Gervais, but with uh, Steve mm -hmm. Carey. Okay. About uh, cinema, my, my, my number one is, is uh, it's a film that uh, a few people know. It's called The Man from Earth. Um, then I've got The Nightmare Before Christmas, of course. Uh, Princess Bride, because I'm still a kid. And uh, Love Actually, because I'm French and I'm romantic. And then uh, about the books, so the choice was very, very, very complicated. So I will be very fast, okay? Uh, never Ending Story, of course. Unbelievable book. Uh, Shutter Island, love that. Les Oiseaux, The Birds from Daphne du Maurier. Uh, the Pillars of Earth, you can miss this one. Uh, Club Dumas from uh, Arturo Perez Reverte. Of course, John Fante, we call it my stupid dog, but it's uh, uh, West from Rome. And then my favorite, the, the, the book that made me, uh, well, not a man, but, but I, I, grew, I grew with this book. 
It's called uh, The Catcher on the Rye by Salinger. <laughs> Love this one very much. And not to spoil things, The Catcher in the Rye comes into the second book of the trilogy as a very important part to play there. So yes, it is real life. Important part. I have a final question for you both. Um, as Flo mentioned at the beginning, um, why do you think France is producing some of the highest caliber crime writing in the world? And which other French crime writers would you recommend? Why, why is there such a, a plethora of, of good Fran uh, crime writing from France? Well, I think the fact is that French society over the last two generations has changed enormously. It's, it's, uh, it's not recognizable for people who, who, who thought of Paris in the 1960s and the 1970s. As we've seen, it's a much more complicated society, a much more violent society, a much more difficult society. And of course, it's the police who, have, who are the first people who have to, to venture into these, th th this new society, into the jagged edges of, of what's going on all around them. And where the police go, the, the crime fiction writers follow very quickly afterwards. And that, I think that's what, what makes some of the, the writing now so vivid. It's mm -hmm. But uh, as I was starting to translate um, Olivier's books, it coincided with the retranslation of all Simonon's Maigret novels, the whole 60 or 70 of them. And if you, if you look at them with uh, Maigret puffing on his pipe and drinking beer and having a cognac and uh, Mrs. Maigret looking after all his needs, his breakfast, his lunch, his supper and tucking him up in bed. And he, he operates out of the Quai des Orfèvres by the Seine and it's, it's very much the the tourist France we know, and the criminals are in fact, they're, they're sort of lost individuals who can't help what they're doing. And, and in the end, almost always confess to Maigret, who's worked it all out in his mind. And there's, there's very little action, there's very little violence in them. If you contrast that to what Olivier and the, the other writers of now are writing about in France, they're the ones who are, who are bringing us, as he said, getting rid of the cliches and bringing us up rubbing our noses almost into what France is now and making us see that it's not what we, you know, the comfortable, nostalgic view that we have of it. So I think that, I think that the, the, the French writers of today have tapped into that very well. Olivier? Yeah, I'm, I'm totally, I totally agree with, uh, with Nick. Uh, I, I think that um, crime novels are history, book in ad, uh, history books in advance. If you want to know a society, if you want to know a country, you just have to, to open a book. Um, but I didn't know that I didn't know that France was producing some of the highest caliber crime, crime writing in the world. I, I, I'm happy to know that. I knew for the food, I knew for the cheese, I knew for the wine, but I had no idea uh, for the crime writing. And I don't have really any answer to that. Um, I just think that the art in general, painting, writing, poetry, everything, is the soul of a country. You, you remember a country by its wars and its culture. And without art, there is no history. So if you want to learn about a country, you just have to open a book. And a French one, why not? And one of mine's, why not? Even better. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a lovely um, note to end on. Thank you very much, Olivier and Nick. And um, I'm very look, much looking forward to The Lost and the Damned being published in November and the rest of the trilogy over the coming years. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I just want to say to Nick that uh, maybe I didn't tell him, but um, I know that uh, it's uh, thanks to you uh, that uh, this adventure is uh, happening to me. So I will never say, I will never say thanks enough uh, to you, Nick. So uh, I wanted to do it... Uh, now live here okay well i always remember as a translator the author comes first then the translator so thank you as well a bientôt. a bientôt if you enjoyed this evening's conversation between olivier norek and his translator nick caster and would like to read the lost and the damned it's not it will be published in november this year by maclehose press but you can pre-order the novel from a good bookshop near you and I would really encourage you to do so. Thank you.